Okay, everybody, welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point this week. It's Wednesday, June 30th, 2021, and it's the end of the first half of the year. So we've got a great show for you today. I'm your host, Justin Nielsen, and on today's show, we have Jim Golan. Jim is the co-portfolio manager at William Glare Large Cap Growth strategy. And uh, the ticker for that is LCGFX, if you want to take a look at that particular mutual fund. Um, so on today's podcast, we're going to dive into the markets. And Jim is going to spend some time talking about how he builds a highly concentrated, high conviction portfolio that's kind of meant to go for the long term. And so we'll take a look at that. And he'll also share with us some ideas. So hey, Jim, thanks a lot for being with us this week. Thanks, Justin. Uh, great to be here today. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, and we'll just pull up the NASDAQ chart. Jim, we basically had this area where we've been going sideways for a little while ever since February, the mid February uh, point, but it seems like we've had a turning point. Um, I will say that there was kind of a, what we call a distribution day cluster right in here around 14,000 where uh, it, it started to look like we were getting some distribution days, but nothing too concerning. And I think more importantly, whereas that 14,000 level was something that we hit, uh, we could only spend a few days above it before, now we're getting well established above that line and so it uh, that, that level. And it really seems like there's been a change in focus, growth is back and uh, you know birds are singing and things are looking up for us. What yeah, do you think? Everyone's happy. Everyone's yeah. happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, just taking a step back, you know, last year, you know, with the pandemic, it was really about, you know, high growth, high valuation, growth was scarce. Uh, people are rotating to those stocks um, and away from what we call the COVID losers, you know, like the hospitality industry travel. Right. Um, you get to November of last year when the vaccine announcement started coming out. You saw a rotation back into the market in terms of, you know, the COVID recovery plays and, and value and cyclicality. And we started to see, you know, rates start to tick up as people start to anticipate the economy coming back in a pretty big way and concerns about inflation. Um, right. and I think the inflation concerns are more transitory, uh, primarily just driven by the fact that, you know, logistically things are still kind of out of whack, um, you know, uh, we're looking for for employees to work and you know these things will get resolved over time and what we've really seen over the past month or so in this kind of the shift back to growth is you know investors have become confident that inflation is not going to be an issue and the rates have started to tick back downward again particularly the 10-year rate that investors focus in on a lot and with that uh, there's been a rotation back into growth I also think people are kind of thinking right now that we're getting pretty close in terms of the peak of economic activity here in the US, probably sometime during the third quarter. Doesn't mean that we're going back into a recession, it's just we're at the peak and we'll start to see some deceleration in terms of growth. Uh, the thing I'll be watching pretty closely as we move forward during the rest of this year is just the PMI index. Uh, you know, right now that's over over 60. That's usually pretty uh, positive for the overall economy. I think that's probably going to peak out probably later this year, early next year, and start to roll over. Again, not meaning we're going into a recession. It's just meaning the economic growth will start to slow. And in that type of environment, growth stocks typically do pretty well. And, and why the PMI index? Why does that get so much attention from you? Well, it's, it's looking at what uh, purchasing managers are, are looking at. It's it's a it's a, a, a index that kind of looks at overall uh, global economic activity, industrial activity. It just shows that things are really heating up. And and typically, when it's over sixty, it, it tells you things are really strong. When it gets close to fifty or under fifty, typically that tells you tells you that you're you're probably pretty close to a recession. Or a recessionary environment. So if we, we top out, you know, at 64, 65, start to go downward, my guess it probably stabilizes in the upper 50s for a while. Again, the economy is still growing, but not at the same rate that, that we experienced over the prior few months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you kind of touched a little bit on the whole inflationary idea of being transitory. Um, you know, with this last Fed meeting, uh, I think, you know, a few people were surprised that some of the the Fed rate hikes might be coming a little bit sooner than expected. Um, yep. A few more of the 
you know, the, the, the Fed guys were starting to talk about, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm thinking maybe even, uh, you know, before 2023, uh, a, a few more were kind of on that side. Um, does the, the Fed, does that kind of shift in thinking bother you at all? Or is that something that you feel like we still have a long ways to go before we have to worry about that? Yeah, it, it really doesn't bother me. I think investors were thinking probably early 2023, and maybe now it's later 2022. Um, and, you know, if we do get a couple of rates hikes, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. I'm not in the camp where, you know, some argue that like the 10 year bond will, will go up to like three or 4%. I'm not in that camp. Um, mm -hmm. There's just too much debt out there, particularly at the government level, that, you know, we just can't afford to have rates go up dramatically. So if, if the 10 year eventually gets up to 2%, two and a quarter, you know, I think that's very doable for the economy. Um, but, I think right now there's just you know a lot of stimulus in the system. People are coming back, spending money. They saved a lot of money last year. And importantly, you know, something to think about is, you know, people who invest in the market have gained a lot of wealth in the past year, really over right. the past couple of years. And you look at their homes. You know, if they own a home, a home and haven't had a lot of opportunities to spend it. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like. There's a lot of stuff out there that people want to do, whether it's going to a concert or going to a right. baseball game. And that's just going to be a powerful tailwind for the economy uh, over the over the coming months and quarters ahead. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, the, the, the 10 year Treasury. I just put up a, a, a quick chart here on the yield just to kind of um, go from that point that you were making of that, you know, really just spike that it had from November, yeah. um, you know, but then it really kind of peaked in April. Uh, the beginning of April and has has kind of been on a downtrend since. And you know, what does that do for your models? I guess, uh, especially with growth, when you know so much of the the growth companies are kind of looking at, or so many of the models kind of look at this ten year Treasury and interest rates in terms of you know what the what the future holds for these growth companies. Yeah, I mean, you know, growth stocks are long duration assets, and you know, when rates start to go up. Uh, that has an impact on, on the valuations of growth companies. And, and we saw that, you know, earlier this year when value and cyclicality kind of took over. Uh, with rates pulling back, uh, obviously, that's been a, a more of a tailwind for growth over the last month or two. And that's, again, that's why we've seen growth stocks really start to come back in vogue again with the pullback in rates. And that's just largely due to the fact that investors have become confident that inflation is going to be a transitory issue. Uh, we're not going to be going back to like where we were in the 1970s with mm -hmm. inflation spiking and, right. and um, prices going up all the time. Um, there's just a lot of factors that keep you know inflation in check, whether it's globalization or most notably technology, with you know automation and improving overall productivity. That just has a huge impact in terms of the inflationary environment, and that's why you know. You know, we just don't think inflation is going to be that big of an issue, and that's that's being reflected in interest rates right now. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other indexes. I mean, we we talked about the Nasdaq Composite, the whole idea of technology. Now, the S and P five hundred that's still at you know new highs, and yep. it, it still seems like it's chugging along. Um, it, it's there's certainly been a little bit of a shift. You know, again, more of the the technology has started coming on lately, as opposed to you know, what was really driving it before was the energy stocks, the materials, um, industrials. Um, do, you, do you see the S&P 500 uh, still continuing higher, uh, even though maybe, maybe oil and some of those cyclicals don't get the love that they were? Yeah, no, it's, you know, the S&P 500 is, is a core index. So it has a mixture of growth companies and a mixture of value companies. Um, composing the index. And, you know, I think technology represents about 25% yeah. of the index. So when technology starts to kick in, I mean, obviously that's positive and, and energy and, and financials, particularly energy is I think like roughly four or 5% of the index. So it has less of an impact, you know, it's had a big move over the past few months uh, with the rise in oil prices. But, you know, if, if technology, which is, you know, most notably in the growth bucket, really starts to kick back in, my expectation would be S&P 500 would continue to work higher during the second half of this year and going into next year. Now, just in terms of an overall trend, you mentioned how, you know, especially after vac vaccination day, as, as we like to call it, you know, November right. 9th, um, you know, all the news starts coming out of, of the vaccinations. They're uh, amazing 
uh, efficacy, really. Uh, you yeah. know, just, just uh, you know, being in the 90s was, I think, more than anyone could have hoped for. Um, now, that led to a lot of the reopening plays, travel, again, as you mentioned, this pent-up demand. Um, but a lot of that has been kind of tempered lately. Um, do you think they, you know, those industries got a little bit uh, ahead of themselves, a little bit over their skis, uh, uh, you know, a little bit too excited, and this is just kind of a normal pullback in some of those areas? Or is this, you know, fears of the Delta variant and yeah, uh, something, yeah. something more? <laughs> Yeah, first of all, it, it's absolutely amazing that we were able to get a vaccine out within, you know, 10 months. I mean, that yeah. just shows the innovation uh, that we have with our biopharma companies coming out with something like that so quickly. I think the, the concerns right now, why we've seen a bit of a pullback and kind of like the recovery plays is, is the Delta variant, um, you know, and it seems like at least what I've read so far, the, the, the two vaccines, the mRNA vaccines, uh, seem to do a pretty good job in terms right. of handling that. So the important thing is, is that people get vaccinated um, because if they don't, we're never gonna get herd immunity. This thing will, the COVID will, will, will stay around. And it will probably become more seasonal, kind of like the flu uh, during the fall and the winter. But I think what, what if you kind of look back, I think it was on Monday when you saw this big rotation of growth and away from value and recovery plays, it was just the news on the Delta variant mm -hmm. and kind of spreading a bit throughout the U.S. and globally. And I think people are concerned about, you know, maybe new lockdowns at some point later this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly doubt that's going to happen, uh, particularly as people get vaccinated, it becomes just less of an issue for folks. But I think that was kind of what, what drove the market on Monday in terms of concerns about this variant. Yeah. But we've had, you know, concerns about variants, you know, over the course of this year and, and you know, they largely get washed out over time. Right. And I mean, again, it's a very thing, I mean, the important thing is if you look at the hospitals, um, you know, unlike a year ago, they're not filled with COVID patients. So hospitalizations are down, are down dramatically. Case counts are down dramatically. Um, I think our, our healthcare analyst was telling me that, you know, as of last week, we had something like 11,000 cases of COVID mm -hmm. uh, a year ago, or at its peak, it was close to a quarter million. Right. So that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, again, it just goes back to the work we did with the vaccines and getting it out so quickly. Just and the hospitalizations are people that are unvaccinated. Uh, for right. the most part. And so, yeah, something yeah, like 99% of the hospitalizations right. are people who are not vaccinated, over right. 99%. So get vaccinated. Okay. So after the break, we're going to discuss how Jim builds a high conviction uh, portfolio you know, for, for William Blair and how he takes that long-term approach. What are the factors he looks at? And we'll do a deep dive right after this break. Do you want to conquer market volatility? We can help you protect your hard-earned capital. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to 72 hours in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds, so you can finally stop guessing what's going to happen next. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Learn how successful traders generate their wealth. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. I'm Justin Nielsen, and my guest this week is Jim Golan from the William Blair Large Cap Growth Fund. So before the break, we were talking a little bit about the market and some of these trends that have shifted uh, back to growth. Let's talk about how you build your portfolio, Jim. Uh, you're pretty, pretty concentrated for a mutual fund. Yeah, we have roughly 30 holdings in the fund, uh, pretty low turnover uh, relative to an average large cap manager, runs about 25% a year or so. Concentrated portfolio, as I said, conviction based. Uh, but the unique thing, one of the unique things is it's diversified. So okay. we have 30 holdings, but we diversify across sectors. Mm -hmm. and the reason why we do that, we believe it just lessens the overall volatility that you typically might see with a concentrated manager. Mm -hmm. And so we're generating alpha uh, and we're typically doing it at a lower risk level than the market. So kind of unique, kind of a unique animal out there in the marketplace. Right. And, and so, you know, you're diversified across a number of sectors. Are there any sectors that are like, hey, we're not 
we're not touching these utilities. Yeah, we're at, yeah. it's, it's like we, we say major economic sector. So like energy is, uh, we measure ourselves against the Russell 1000 growth index is might, might be like 30 basis points of the index. Mm -hmm. So unless we find something really unique in the energy space, we won't have anything there. Uh, just, you know, energy is a commodity and, right. and there's really no competitive moat uh, for any of the energy companies out there. But, you know, we'll have um, uh, holdings across all the sectors such as technology, consumer, uh, healthcare, industrials, financials, mm -hmm. um, and, and run a diversified portfolio from there. Mm -hmm. So talk to me a little bit about how you get to the point where you can have such high conviction. One of the things you just mentioned was those those companies with that competitive moat. Can you Talk a little bit about what that means and how you identify companies with these uh, qualities that you're looking for. Yeah, so let, let's take a quick step back. Um, what we're looking for, we're looking across two different two different areas. So one is we look at the industries. Uh, we want to invest in industries that we consider to be secular growth. Mm -hmm. By that mean, by that I mean industries that are going to be growing faster than the overall economy for for multiple years. Uh, due to a variety of drivers. Uh, so for example, if you look at like advertising, uh, okay. typically most of the advertising dollars went through traditional media, you know, print, radio, uh, television. And with the growth of the internet and people going online, we've seen ad dollars migrate over to um, uh, online and be part of digital advertising. So a company like a Google or, you know, or Alphabet uh, has, has taken tremendous share of that growth over time. So it's a secular growing industry that we look at. Uh, another industry might be in cloud-based computing um, right. where, where Microsoft Azure competes. Uh, they're basically taking share away from on-premise um, uh, technology hosted by companies. Mm -hmm. And those companies are shifting workloads to the cloud. So it's a secular growth industry. So we, it's important that we identify those industries. We, we want like a tailwind behind us in terms of growth. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we start to look at the companies. Um, and this is where we look at the competitive moat. Uh, companies that have uh, maybe unique distribution, uh, value added products or services, um, a culture of innovation uh, through productive use of R&D dollars, and right. ultimately some sort of pricing power. Mm -hmm. um, and then that ultimately flows in ter terms of the financials, in terms of a fairly high degree of recurring revenues, which leads to predictable earnings, strong free cash flow, high returns on invested capital, high ROE. Uh, so what we're really looking for are companies that are what we call er um, earnings compounders, mm -hmm. who consistently grow their earnings over time. And it's our belief as you know, earnings compound that will ultimately get reflected in the stock price. And overlaying all of this is just management. You know, right. Can the management team execute? Uh, do they have a history of execution? Are they aligned with shareholders? And importantly, in the large cap space, do they have the ability to reinvent themselves, come mm -hmm. up with a second act or third act? And this is really important in large cap because as companies get bigger, saturate yeah. their market, you know, they hit a wall. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find new growth avenues, uh, typically your stock will struggle. So the ability to reinvent themselves is a key characteristic that we look for in the companies that we invest in. So at the end of the day, we want, you know, basically structural winners, you know, great industries, and then, you know, leaders within those industries who are taking share of the profit pool, uh, which leads to the earnings compounding and ultimately the stock outperformance over time. So kind of upward and to the right with the stock. Right. So now a lot of people, I mean, they, they like to be in on these trends early, you know, um, maybe before the earnings are starting to compound at a high level, um, maybe when they're a, a little bit in that turnaround, you know, that's it's like, hey, I see the runway down there and I see the trend going this way, but maybe they haven't proven themselves with the earnings yet or, you know, uh, what, what have you. Maybe they're still getting their, that research and development is so high. It's, you know, there, there's still some large costs. Um, how early are you into this? How much, I guess, of that, you know, look, we need the proof the proof that you're able to execute here um, before you invest, um, or are you are you getting some of these a little bit on the earlier side? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, obviously, if you get in early, that's that's where you really get the power of the compounding earnings and then the stock performance. So I'll give you an example. If, if you kind of think like the software industry, um, 
great growth during the 80s and 90s, tech bubble hit, bursted. Um, you know, from there onward, they kind of struggle. Traditional mm-hmm. software, legacy software companies. So think of a company like Adobe. Right. You know, once they kind of uh, saturated their market and it became really hard to grow. And you fast forward to like 2012 when they, when they yeah. changed their business model from a one-time sale of the creative suite of products. So Adobe makes you know, creative content that you know, designers use for the web and, and other things. But they changed their business model in 2012 to go from that one-time sale, which cost like $2,000 for a software license to a software as a service model mm-hmm. where it's a monthly recurring charge. Right. And the beauty of that for the user is Adobe's, you know, constantly upgrading, um, um, upgrading uh, their, their services and, and, the, and the product quality. So we started to do work on Adobe like in 2013, 2014, because we thought it was pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, earnings got hit pretty hard during that time frame. Right. But when we looked out five, six years, we thought that Adobe was in a great position um, to derive earnings growth, be one of these earnings compounders, throw off a lot of cash flow, and it really came to fruition. So yeah, it, it takes a lot of work and, and you have to have confidence in terms of can the company make that switch? And our confidence grew from you know talking with management, understanding their vision, and basically believing that the software as a service model was the right way to go and potentially could be very, very powerful in terms of earnings. And so we started getting active in Adobe in 2013, 2014, and, and the rest is kind of history. Mm-hmm. But it was just one of those examples of a company that I wouldn't say it was in a turnaround, but they were kind of struggling for growth, new avenues for growth. And you can see after the tech bubble burst, the stock kind of treaded water right. for a decade. And, and the earnings were very lumpy. I mean, it was yeah, all based because, on their cycle. You know, it, it was, almost turned yeah, cyclical no, they, to a degree. They, they've come out with a new creative suite product every two yeah. or three years. You get a big jump in earnings and then boom, there was nothing after that. Yeah. So by going to this recurring revenue model, it basically, you know, it fits nicely in terms of what we're looking for. We want recurring revenues. And mm-hmm. you can see it in terms of the stock performance over the past, you know, seven, eight years. It's just been really a home run. Uh, for yeah. investors you know, and a home run for us and our clients. And and so for those that aren't watching the video portion of this, um, I, I, I did throw up an Adobe chart. Uh, just look at the monthly chart and you can see exactly what Jim is talking about, uh, where it really was this kind of sideways action for, you know, four or five years where not much was happening. And then this burst uh, after after 2012, 2013. And, and, you know, Adobe really, I mean, there were a lot of companies that, saw what Adobe did and they, hey, you know what? We're turning into the subscription as a service. Yeah, no, <laughs> they, they, they followed, the, followed the Adobe playbook, you know, most yeah. Microsoft. And you could and see, you could see them, boom. like once they took that, you know, <laughs> you could see this happening over and over in all of these different companies. And to a degree, it, it wasn't just software. I'm, I'm um, you know, this was something that you saw in a lot of industries uh, happening. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's the importance of reinvent, reinventing the business model and coming up with the second act. Mm-hmm. And Adobe did this. I mean, they saw what, you know, the, the smaller software as a service companies did, you know, during this time frame, and uh, Adobe had copied it. And they could do it because it's pretty much a monopoly. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a user of, of the creative suite or the creative cloud, you really have nowhere else to go. Adobe right. has the best product, the best services. Again, value-added products, value-added services, ultimately leads to the pricing power and 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 you know people you know staying with Adobe. And again, it's reflected in the stock over the past seven years. Mm-hmm. So, so you've you've identified you know okay these these are the industries we want to be in. Um, uh, I assume you kind of look within those industries and you're like narrowing it down to the leaders. Um, now, what about you know, this, this kind of disruptive technology. And that's something that I think a lot of people have been focusing on lately, um, where you've got kind of this, this new player in there and, you know, they're either creating their own industry, you know, to a certain degree, a a branch off, if you will. Um, And, you know, we've definitely seen a lot of IPOs uh, that that have been coming to market recently with some of this disruptive technology. How, um, how early in, the cycle are you for some of these, or do you really kind of need them to, to have a couple of years behind them so that you can know what you're yeah. dealing with? Yeah, we really have to have uh, a few years to see how it's going to materialize. Um, you know, I went through the tech bubble in the late 90s, 2000s, 
And yeah. I think back then, like how many companies actually survived? Well, you just threw dot com on your name and that was your business model. Yeah, right? <laughs> and it became real companies and, and, yeah. and the markets has migrated this high growth, high valuation. Don't worry about earnings, don't worry about cash flow seen that move before, doesn't usually end well. Having said that, there will be a few companies that's going to come out of this in great position. Right. And you know, we've identified a couple, we're, we're kicking the tires. Um, but if you go back to the tech bubble, it's really Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Google wasn't even public back then. So um, Netflix, I think, uh, was one that came out of it. Uh, Yahoo right. for a while was doing okay until it kind of- uh, Until it wasn't. You know, <laughs> no, it wasn't right. <laughs> so it's it's just really really hard, you know, to make that next step. And 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 you see companies with you know a billion in revenues and market caps of seventy or eighty billion dollars. It's just like you kind of scratch your head. But there right. there are a couple of companies that we've looked at, we've identified, we're, we're watching closely, and that's what we do. We we spend a lot of time, you know, looking at companies, and you know, it goes back to our turnover twenty five percent a year. We're buying probably six new investments every year. Okay. Uh, pretty high bar to get in the portfolio, but we have a list of companies that potentially could be candidates for the portfolio at some point down the road. So. Right. So let's talk a little bit about what makes something exit from the portfolio. Uh, is it, you know, that what, what makes you think, okay, this has been played out or if it's something that enters your portfolio and you've got this three, five year time horizon, what makes you say, Hey, you know what? This this thesis didn't work out the way we thought, or something else came in, disrupted, disrupted it. Um, what are yeah. the kind of things that you look at that kind of say, hey, it's it's time to to cut and run on this one? Yeah. So the, the first thing in terms of our our sell process, it's it's valuation. Okay. Is everything fully baked into the numbers, and that's probably you know 60, 70 percent of our our sell candidates in the portfolio is just valuation and played out well. Mm -hmm. um, the second is just a change change in thesis. Uh, I go back to the industry and, and, and then the company, like industry, if, if something has changed in the industry in terms of the competitive dynamics, or if on a secular basis, when you can look out five years, it just doesn't look as interesting as it did five years earlier when you bought the stock, um, you know, that then becomes a candidate for sale. But typically it's, it's, it's the industry or there's just something that's, that's not clicking with the company, they're not executing well. Mm -hmm. And we like to tell, say to folks, like, we want to create constant buying pressure in the portfolio. So our analysts are out there, you know, constantly looking at new ideas. Mm -hmm. So we might at any given point in time have three or four ideas, trying to get them into the portfolio when it's so concentrated. They right. really have to be good ideas. And if they are better than what we have in the portfolio right now, then, um, you know, that existing name uh, that we have less confidence in, less conviction, will exit the portfolio. Mm -hmm. for a newer for a newer idea right something comes in something's got to go out basically absolutely yeah yeah and uh, again that's that's one of the things that uh our founder bill o'neill you know he used to talk about you know you gotta you gotta pull your weeds right and uh, and water water your flowers uh, a lot of people like to do it the opposite way but uh that's that's the right way to do it so right. we'll get more into uh some gardening tips um with some actual uh names uh right here after the break stay tuned do you feel like you're always late to the best trades? You don't have to kick yourself for those missed opportunities any longer. Today is your day. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence has helped traders of all experience levels with its predictive analysis forecasting. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how their AI automatically recognizes global market patterns well ahead of the news to help you pick the best trade. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com to join a free live training session today. Vantage Point's patented artificial intelligence can give you a massive edge. Don't hesitate. Save your seat now. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to Investing with IVD podcast, sponsored by Vantage Point. I'm Justin Nielsen, your host, and I'm joined by Jim Golan, the William Blair Large Cap Growth Fund co-portfolio manager. And before the break, we were talking a little bit about what he looks for in these companies. Uh, he's got a high conviction portfolio, uh, very concentrated. So basically, if something's going to get in, something's got to go out. And uh, one of the things you were talking about was valuation. Um, could you talk real quickly about, you know, your expectations for how much you expect a company to go, I guess, grow for you and what 
kind of indicators get into that valuation telling you, hey, it's, it's, it's run its course? Yeah, so I mean, any new idea that gets into the portfolio, we, we have to be able to pencil in a double over five years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all our analysts build you know long-term industry models, long-term um, earnings models for our companies, and um, with myself and David Ritchie, who's a co-manager of our strategy, uh, just have to feel confident that that's the case. And when we run a conviction-based portfolio with pretty low turnover, um, you know, six new ideas a year. It's a pretty high bar to get in the portfolio. So there's right. a lot of stuff that we look at and we can only pencil maybe a 60 or 70% return in five years. It just won't make it into the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So we just have that have to have that conviction um, that can double in five years. You know, some of the things we look at, you know, we build long-term models, as I said, uh, but we'll look at, you know, earnings over five years, five, six years, try to understand the earnings power of the company. Uh, we try to understand the free cash flow dynamics because ultimately that's how you value a company. So we'll do like, you know, you know, simple PE analysis. Um, we do do discount cash flow analysis. Obviously, you know, you have to be careful in terms of what goes in the model in terms of the right. DCF. And then, you know, EVA analysis. That's, that's another thing that we have access to. So we look at a whole slew of valuation techniques. Uh, it's not just one then, indicator. <laughs> no, it's just we and we kind of yeah. come up with like kind of a general price what 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 the company's worth. We we don't have like a specific price target, but any idea that gets in the portfolio, we have to be able to pencil you know a double in five years, at least a double. Right. So let's get into some ideas that you're currently looking at, and you know maybe some trends that you're seeing going forward. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with uh, Intuit? Uh, so the ticker symbol yeah. on that is I N T U. You've got that long-term perspective, so it seems like the monthly chart is probably the most uh, uh, relevant to what you're looking at. Right. Yeah, this is this you know into it. Uh, for those who don't know it, um, is a leader in tax software. So think TurboTax. Right. And then accounting software, QuickBooks for small and medium businesses. And this has been a tremendous company, you know, since they were founded and became public back in the 1980s a true earnings comp compounder. And the reason why they've done so well is their ability um, to innovate. They just mm -hmm. have a culture of innovation. And you think of like the tax market, you know, tax filings to the IRS grows about 1% a year. Mm -hmm. You say, well, how's this a growth company? It's a growth company because they're taking share from the do-it-yourself folks who people do taxes themselves without any software. Uh, there are actually people who still do that. And they take share away from professional tax preparers because their, their software product, TurboTax, is so good, so compelling, so easy to use that people have just migrated to using TurboTax over time. And then when I talk about culture of innovation, one of the things they did recently over the past you know, two or three years is come up with a new product called TurboTax Live. I, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. The, the, the really neat thing about this yeah. is what they discovered was they probably had an attrition rate of about 20, 25 percent uh, from folks who were using TurboTax. They had some sort of complexity, maybe a new mm -hmm. child or, or some complexity, and they lost confidence and they dropped off and they went to a tax preparer. Right. With TurboTax Live, you get access to an accountant, a tax preparer. Uh, online, you know, for whatever, 30, 45 minutes to address that issue for a small, you know, uptick in terms of the fee, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the client saves money because they're not going to a tax preparer to do the, the full return. Uh, they get the, the, the answer, uh, um, answer uh, the question answered, and they get their tax return file. And, and the, the beauty for, 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 quick, uh, for TurboTax and Intuit is that the average revenue her return file for, for TurboTax has actually increased at probably you know, a seven or 8% rate over the past couple of years. So this goes back to TurboTax Live, being innovative, uh, coming out with new ways to, to please their customers, value-added products, value-added services. And again, this just flows into the financials in terms of compounding earnings, you know, generating a relatively high degree of recurring revenues because everyone has to file their taxes at some point. Right. You know, predictable earnings, strong free cash flow, high returns on invested capital. You know, just kind of like this steady eddy company that we just think the market is just underestimating the power of the of the of the culture of innovation at the company. 
And this has really just been a great stock for many, many years. And it's been, you know, a long-term holding for our, for our fund, uh, the large cap growth fund. Right. And one of the things, you know, that uh, this is actually on our long-term leaders list at I IVD. Um, and one of the reasons is, as you mentioned, that that growth rate, uh, the five-year annual compounded earnings growth rate is 20%, which, yep. is, which is pretty incredible. And we have an earnings stability rating, which goes from one to 99, one being the most stable. And this is a seven. And it's, you know, when, yep. when you start getting under 10, you're talking about something with very stable earnings. And so into it definitely falls in that category. And, and, you know, as, as a TurboTax user myself, you know, you have one question, you know, maybe that comes up and every three years or something where it's yeah. like, I'm just not quite sure on this one thing. And, and, you know, having someone to just bounce that off of um, make, makes a big difference so that you don't have to be, you know, trying to Google it and, you know, <laughs> do your taxes Absolutely. that way. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, um, okay, let's uh, go ahead and get into another one. Um, this is one that a lot of people are probably familiar with, uh, Microsoft. And, um, you know, Mr. Softy here, I mean, this is one we were talking about how, gosh, there was almost a decade. I mean, you, you talk about the bubble and, you know, 2000, Microsoft, Microsoft seemed like it was done for a decade yep. where it just really didn't do anything. What, what changed and what put this back on your radar? Yeah, so as you said, it was a decade, you know, I mean, software company, you know, office, you know, products, things like that. I mean, th their growth was driven by the, the growth of PCs. And when the market became saturated, you know, they struggled for more than a decade and investors became very frustrated with the stock. And if you go back to really 2013, 2014, when they were looking for a new CEO, there was a big push to bring in a CEO who was just going to come in there and cut costs. Mm -hmm. And because investors thought this company was X growth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they brought in Satya Nadella, promoted him. Uh, Amy Hood became the CFO, promoted her. And they just laid out a very, you know, crystal vision in terms of, of cloud first, mobility first, being able to work anywhere at any time. Um, if the, the growth of the company was going to be driven by shifting to a software service model, similar to Adobe. Right. And then you know, really growing the, the public cloud, which is Azure. And, you know, Azure has gone from basically nothing to, to, to this year, probably over $30 billion in revenue. So they've done a tremendous job. And this is why I talk about reinventing yourselves. Um, you know, kind of reinventing yourself, coming up with the second act. And the second act was the cloud uh, with Azure. And you can see, you know, the company back in 2014 had the market cap of, you know, 300 billion or so, and today it's over $2 trillion. Right. And so when we take, when I started, you know, taking a look at this company back in 2014, when, when Sache took over, I just felt that there was something different versus what we had seen over the prior decade. And there's a couple of critical things about Microsoft to keep in, in mind. One is, you know, Microsoft has tremendous relationships uh, with their enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. And their enterprise customers really like Microsoft, unlike other tech companies. Uh, so there's a lot of goodwill built up. And so when Microsoft came in, uh, outlined their vision for the next decade or so, I think you started to see some buy-in um, um, from, from some of their customers and, and new customers. So this has really played out nicely and, and earnings really started to kick in in the 2016, 2017 timeframe. Because initially, you know, Azure was unprofitable. But as they scale that up, that has become more profitable, and that's been an right. important driver for earnings growth. But again, you know, a really solid company, um, um, you know, just great, great uh, competitive moat, and it's, it's just been, you know, a terrific stock for the past seven or eight years for investors and, and for our clients, too. So what do you think about this going forward? Is, um, is the move kind of done here or, you know, no, is, is there something that it's got reinventing it, it, itself for? Yeah, future? no, it's uh, it, the cloud is still very early and Microsoft is our largest holding in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, but the cloud is still very early. We think we're probably in the second inning, you know, probably 20% of workloads uh, coming from the on-prem side going to the public, have, have shifted to the public cloud. We think ultimately that gets to about 65%. You know, the cloud today is probably over a hundred billion revenues industry-wide. And we think in the next five to 10 years, that could approach seven to $800 billion. 
Right. So it's still very early for Microsoft. So that's why it remains, you know, the largest holding in our fund. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of uh, put a put an exclamation point on some of those earnings numbers you were you were talking about, this has an EPS growth rate that five year growth rate of twenty percent. So again, a very very strong annual earnings growth rate, and uh, once again that earnings stability of four. Uh, another long term leader that's uh, uh, on on the IBD long term leaders list. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up with Accenture. Uh, ticker symbol sure. on that is ACN. Again, Accenture is a leader in, in global um, um, uh, IT system integrator. Um, you know, the thing that we liked about Accenture is, you know, incredible management team. They have value added products and services. They are the trusted source for, for the Fortune 500 companies. I think they basically dominate the Fortune 500 companies. So when you have a really tough problem, uh, they go to Accenture in terms of, of, of addressing it. Um, where Accenture is really excelling right now is in, in the whole digitization of corporate America and globally. And as you know, we touched on with Microsoft companies, you know, shifting to the cloud. This is where you have to pull Accenture in to help you in terms of transitioning your workloads to the cloud, making sure you're picking the right cloud provider. Um, you know, issues like cybersecurity. Right. Uh, you know, that's been in the headlines now for several months, uh, the first years. <laughs> years, but really over the past, you know, yeah. since, since, yeah. uh, since December, you know, yeah. Accenture is like the first company, you know, a fortune 500 company will call to say, Hey, you know, let's address this. Let's, let's try to fix this to make sure that we don't, you know, lose important customer data or what have you. Uh, but they've done a tremendous job you know, uh, pivoting a company to the whole digitization of, 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 of the global economy. And again, you see it in terms of, you know, predictable earnings, incredible returns on invested capital, high ROE. Again, this is a company we've, we've held for a long period of time. You know, it's a pretty steady company upward and to the right, playing with all the right secular trends. Uh, again, depth and breadth of resources in terms of their employees, a really, really great company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to kind of uh, mention the EPS growth rate on this one is a little bit less, uh, 11%, but very stable earning stability rating of two. Now, um, I, I was reading a blog post of yours uh, from last year. And, you know, mm -hmm. again, one of the things you were talking about last year, which, again, no, no big surprise, a lot of things in terms of the cloud and, um, you know, uh, this, this whole idea of being able to work from anywhere that certainly got shifted forward, you know, digital payments, um, you know, e-commerce, all of this stuff when the shutdown happened and, you know, people are having to try and figure out how to work from home. Um, so how do you see that trend? Uh, did, did, did that play out the way you thought it would? And what do you see as the future trend now that we're reopening and, you know, some people are going back to work and uh, do, do, you, do you think there's going to be a shift back? Or is there something else going on that you think is, is kind of a permanent thing going forward? Yeah, I think, you know, the trends you mentioned are, are still very real. Um, I think in certain cases, they've accelerated, particularly mm -hmm. the shift to the cloud. I mean, if you talk to Accenture, I mean, they are just super busy right now. Companies are, you know, initially companies had to transition folks to work from home. Right. And once you got past that, it's just like we have to take a step back and understand where we're going in terms of technology, where we want to go in terms of digitization of our workforce. And so companies like Accenture are very busy right now. Microsoft is seeing the same thing. So that uh, has accelerated. You know, My thought would, it would be like 10 to 15 years. I think mm -hmm. now it's gonna be closer to five to 10 years mm -hmm. uh, where we, we really digitize everything. I think on the, on the uh, digital currency side, that is also accelerating. I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I, pulled cash out of my wallet, either, <laughs> right. you know, either Venmo with PayPal or Zelle or using a credit well, for goodness card. sake, writing a check. I mean, who does writing, that I mean, <laughs> I think I've written one check in 12 months. Um, it's just, it's, so that's, that's, that's occurring at a very fast pace. Um, so all these trends that, you know, I was discussing a year or so ago are still very real, uh, have accelerated and are going to be dominant themes, I think for the next several years. So part of the whole secular growth that I talked about. Anything new later. that you see? Uh, I, I think one one trend that is 
was occurring, but it's really accelerating is what we're seeing in terms of people exiting traditional television, cable television, and shifting to various streaming services. And there's so um, many options out there now. There, there are just so many options out there and traditional TV just doesn't offer you a lot. A lot of the good content's going to streaming. Right. And what, what you're gonna be left with on traditional television is news, um, sports, and that's sort of changing a bit now, and advertising, watching ads. Uh, you right. just look at the number of, you know, just the ad loads on television today, it has increased significantly uh, over the past few years. And it's just become, it's made traditional television just less interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. So streaming is something that has really accelerated uh, more, more than I you know, originally envisioned maybe a year ago in terms of people going, going to various streaming services. Well, and with so much original content coming out from some of these streamers, it's one of those things where, look, if you don't have them, then you're missing out. And you know, yep. if everyone's talking at the water cooler uh, or on Zoom, whatever the case may be, yeah. <laughs> about a certain show, you got to kind of have have that access. You have uh, to have it. Yeah. So, exactly. well, thank you so much, uh, Jim, for joining us this week. I really appreciate your time. Justin, this has been great. A lot of fun and uh, hope to speak to you soon. Okay, absolutely. So next week on Investing with IVD Podcast, we're going to have Pedro Palandrani uh, from research. Uh, he's a research analyst at Global X ETF. So he'll be on the show. Make sure you tune in for that. And that's it for this week with Investing with IVD. I'm Justin Nielsen. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.